Thanks so much for joining today. I'm Della Rucker. I am the principal of the Wise Economy Workshop, and I am here today with Horton Hobbs, who is with the Greater Springfield Partnership. We, I've known Horton for far more years than either of us wants to admit. I am thrilled today to be able to talk about the growth and the rebirth of Springfield. Now, that is exciting to me, not just because I like Springfield, I think Springfield's a cool town, but because in so many ways, it's a great example of what's possible for communities that hit rough times when an economy goes through very profound changes and it affects everything. And folks who listen to me have probably heard my story about uh, that experience growing up in Cleveland. And what I've been finding over the past many years is that more and more community, not just in Ohio and in the Midwest, but all over the world, are grappling with a lot of the same issues that a Springfield, a Cleveland, a Milwaukee, and Oxnard, California, that we experienced often in, in our cases, you know, 10, 20, 50 years ago. Not you specifically, but, you know. But but these communities, they're kind of the, the place where we started learning how to do this. And so we're going to talk about kind of two threads of that. One is the thread of downtown revitalization, which, you know, I can geek out on downtown revitalization all day. I know you can as well because you ran the downtown program here for a pretty significant period of time. But also the larger question of what happens to a community writ large, economically and socially, when they go through these periods of change, where the changes that are going on now, the evolutions that communities are experiencing now, in a sense, it started 50 years ago. So I'm really excited to be able to sort of pull out some of the story of how Springfield has come through that experience. Great. It's so, be awesome. yeah, yeah, awesome. So start out, give us a little bit of a framing where Springfield is, what Springfield is like today. So let's talk yeah. about kind of size and space sure. and location and kind of what the community looks like today. Absolutely. Well, Della, thanks again for the opportunity here. I always love talking about my hometown and I tell people often I don't have a job. This is kind of part of my DNA and who I am. And living in your own backyard and doing it here makes it even more special. But uh, Springfield and Clark County is a very unique place, certainly. But I think what makes us uh, really attractive overall is is just our location in particular. So Clark County is right in the middle of Dayton and Columbus, right on I-70. Uh, the city of Springfield is the principal city in the county. There are only two cities. New Carlisle is the second. Uh, which is just around 5,000 people. The city of Springfield today officially is about 60,000. The overall county, which includes both of those cities, is about 138,000 total. Now, our city in its heyday, uh, at its peak, was close to 80,000 people in population. So we did see a major decline, but we are starting to see and have seen the stabilization of, of the population, particularly coming out of COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, but we have a very large um, Haitian immigration to the community today that's in some counts, uh, adding approximately 20% to our overall population as we sit and speak today. Uh, the community historically has been a manufacturing town, certainly, and a logistics and distribution town. Mm -hmm. Part of that is we make things, but we also get things to market very easily. And that has a lot to do with the transportation network that we're blessed mm -hmm. to have in the community, certainly. But I would tell you, historically, we were very much a heavy manufacturing and automotive type manufacturing community. But over the years, we have strategically uh, and gotten lucky to diversify that uh, pretty significantly within the manufacturing sector. So now you'll certainly see uh, the OEM um, uh, support manufacturers in the, and, and, in the truck. And or or let's equipment just... manufacturers. So, yes. Yeah, OEM. Sorry. I'll try not to use the jargon. I really do we're so to... good at the jargon. I know we are. We're really good at yeah. it. <laughs> but so these are, these are manufacturers mm -hmm. that are making products that then go into the assembly of a vehicle that has a name that you would recognize. That's exactly right. So you were saying that your industry today, you have OEM. So we, these, yep. these parts, these manufacturers of components. That's right. We have a growing aerospace industry, uh, support industry for sure. 
Uh, we're actually in the semiconductor space now as well. So component part manufacturing for uh, the manufacturer of uh, wafers for the semiconductor industry. We have a large uh, presence with that. Mm-hmm. We have a very strong food cluster, uh, both food processing, but also distribution as well. And then a lot of logistics and distribution to balance it out. Uh, one of the growing areas for our community has been insurance over the years. Uh, well, a lot of back office support for third-party insurance carriers. Uh, and that has grown and continued to grow. And now you're seeing uh, a movement to remote work for a lot of that sector of work, mm-hmm. um, which you know certainly helps with with keeping some folks here in the community too and keeping them in their home. COVID's changed a lot of things, but Amen. resiliency coming out of COVID was due in large part to our efforts at diversifying the economy over the last decade. And so it, it is now paying dividends for sure. And that's such a crucial piece for so many of these communities that are going through these transitions, the ones that seem to have the hardest time of it, whether we're in the U.S. or the U.K. or we're now seeing in India, in China, in Vietnam, is that communities that were heavily focused in one industry tend to be the ones that get in the most trouble um, when something changes. It's almost as though it creates a fragility. It feels great while it's (laughs) while it's working good. Exactly. Right. Then everybody's flying high. But if there are national and international systemic changes, that can really, really break the system in a hurry. And just like with many other uh, communities that, um, you know, we're kind of in that first wave of the, you know, I often say the collapse of the Industrial Revolution, which is a little overstated (laughs) because it didn't collapse as much as it started to crumble. Um, but it certainly felt like a collapse, and I think it did here when when it hit. So what happened? Take us back to that point of the, if not the collapse, then the, certainly when the big crumbling started. Yeah, I think, it again, it didn't happen overnight, um, but our reliance on International Harvester at the time, Navistar, as they're known today, who is still has a major presence in our community uh, today, Uh, But at their heyday, they had over 8,000 employees here. And over time, obviously, when you have in our community in some ways, but it also drives the social fabric of the community, the economic um, spinoff, if you will, of the community, whether it be in retail or housing or in the case of a downtown, you know, the resources necessary for individuals to have disposable income to go enjoy a movie or do something like that. So we started to see the decline really in the late 70s, early 80s, and then it really picked up through the 80s to a point where we were really on the verge of losing some of our major core manufacturing, and we ended up losing a lot of it. Uh, We had uh, NAFTA, certainly not to make it political, but NAFTA didn't help us much, uh, certainly in Springfield, because we had some um, cross-border flight of our companies, or at least the base of those companies, which hurt us significantly being a supplier community to those uh, entities. But I think, if I'm being honest with myself and and with the audience, you don't think it ever will get to a point where it's of no return. You're kind of in the moment. You see the issues happening. uh, But you think, because history has told you, well, we'll just rebound or we'll we'll continue to make it. We've had bumps before or we can do this. Like in 1956, we lost one of our major publishers in downtown. And and that was a significant hit. Mm -hmm. But we came back. We came back. And we came back in a way that was maybe stronger at the time. So I think uh, it's easy, as you mentioned it before, it's easy to get kind of caught up in uh, the high of of having a lot of jobs. And then when they start to go or they start to leave it in a a kind of a mass exodus in the hundreds or thousands at a time, then that's a a tipping point for a community. And for our community, um, we had a little bit of both. Mm-hmm. It was a slow trickle. And then there was a massive uh, loss of jobs. And then that has a spiraling effect because if you have a major manufacturer, not only are they having issues and maybe downsizing, mm-hmm. all their suppliers that are throughout your community are also having yeah. the same impact yeah. on their companies. And that has an overall ripple effect on what we do. You know, the core economic developer in me says that we focus on economic-based job creation. So that's that's bringing new dollars, if you will, into the community. We Our strategy does not primarily focus on uh, retail or, or professional services or really the supply side. It's mm-hmm. really about making sure that our economic base is strong mm-hmm. because it provides that disposable income for all those other things that are mm-hmm. 
have more effect from macroeconomics, big issues yeah. uh, in, in the economy. And the diversification piece is so absolutely important. Absolutely. It's core to that uh, that strategy. Mm-hmm. But let's just never forget that in the case of downtowns in particular, for Springfield, a place like Springfield and Clark County, well, our downtown's the heart of our community. And mm-hmm. I have said for you know the better part of two decades that if we don't take care of our heart and our body, the, our body kind of withers. Well, it's the same thing with our downtown. Mm-hmm. We don't take care of that. It withers. And we've seen multiple instances where the overall economy of the community may have been declining. And as a result, our downtown suffered pretty significantly. From yeah. That. I think that heart piece, you know, I've used that phrase as well. And I've been around downtown revitalization for a long time. But that heart piece, like people understand the analogy, but then they say, well, how does it work? How does that really? And you kind of go, <laughs> but a lot of it, it is that psychological component because that is such a visible place for a community. Maybe not, you know, if you're just driving through on the highway, but if you live there, chances are you're downtown for some reason or the other. And if that's a negative experience, then that creates, it is a psychological effect. And because it's many people, it becomes sort of a sociological or a cultural effect. And a lot of times what we saw, we've seen this nationwide, is that when that decline started to happen, the first reaction of communities was to try to do some big thing. (laughs) So there was, and and a lot of times this was done under the aegis of urban renewal, which was a big federal program in the 60s and 70s. So for folks that aren't fully geeked out on American planning history. Urban renewal was intentionally developed to say, okay, we're going to get rid of the old stuff that no longer seems to fit. Blight. <laughs> yes. Especially in that atomic age where everybody's like, oh, well, you know, there's all these this new world and this new opportunity. And that stuff just feels like, like leftovers. So communities very often, you know, there was money available just right. like anything else. So communities very heavily went in a lot of times for actions that in retrospect we go i'm not sure that was a good idea (laughs) exactly i think you visited our museum and in the back of that museum um, there's a downtown model a model of downtown circa 1940 it's not full size but it's you you walk through it so it's big enough to experience i don't know if you saw it yeah what i love about that and when i was at center city i would often walk that model just to kind of refresh. Center City was the downtown. It was the downtown. Was the downtown. That's right. And we still call it Center City down here. But okay. Um, but that was the actual official organization's name. But I would often walk through that to get a sense of what are we trying to accomplish here, knowing that we probably would never have a downtown in the same form that we had before. Mm-hmm. Might be the same function, but not the same form that yeah. was in those models. So in the 40s, we were a very dense, compact downtown. We had two-way streets. We had... Buildings on both sides of the street, shared common walls many times, things yep. you would not typically do today from a building design perspective. New, new development. Yeah, but it created this sense of place, right? Yep. Lots of entertainment. I mentioned before the company that left in the 50s, that was a beginning of a decline. And then in the early 70s, our mall opened just west of our downtown, mm-hmm. outside of the city limits, and it sucked the rest of the life out of the downtown. And it hung on through the early to mid 80s and then we really lost most of everything. The only thing that was left was the center of government. It was where our jail is. It's where our county government was at the time, our city government. Mm -hmm. And it's where a lot of our services are and our federal assets were all located downtown. So I don't know all of the history behind what motivated other than the desire to leverage some federal dollars in in the 70s Mm -hmm. to revitalize. And so we had a thing, it was a, two ballot initiatives, and we called it seven and six. And it was really a way to help the voters vote for bonds to leverage the federal dollars mm-hmm. to incentivize the redevelopment. Because you, yeah. so, you almost always have to have yeah. some kind of local Local's match. They have to match. see that you have some skin in the game. That's exactly right. Always been the case. So people in the community, and again, this yeah. is really common, yeah. people in the community went, oh my gosh, we got to do oh, something. Absolutely. absolutely. So- the something that was presented to them was, I grinned because you said seven and six, and you were saying before that this was in 1970s. It was. So, exactly, you know, yeah. that was rather convenient. Exactly. But there's very much a sense that, oh, my God, we have to do something, and we have to do it big, and we have to do it fast, That's and we right. have to do it now. Yeah. What 
was done with once that money was yep. unlocked and it probably took a couple of years yeah. what what was done yeah it actually probably started earlier in the 70s the actual planning of the thing but what happened was that the core block where city hall is today and we have a 11 story big black modern skyscraper mm-hmm. downtown that block was essentially completely demolished uh and it was planned then as a city hall and then an open space with the hope that a a large tenant would come in, and it and it did happen uh, with the Credit Life Building, and that's a beautifully architected building. It's designed by Skidmore, Owens, and Merle, so it is a significant building. That's the Sears Tower, the Hancock Tower. Yep. yep. Um, so they designed they enormous built. amounts of buildings, and then they brought in. Ar- it was here. Oh yeah, and they brought an architect in too to redesign that whole plaza mm-hmm. and and modernize it. And that was the result. And then it extended outside of that core block to the neighboring streets around it. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if it was done exactly at the same time, but it certainly was done in concert. There was a phenomenon in transportation planning at the time. How do we move as many people through an area as we possibly can? Yep. Remember, downtowns historically and even currently, in many cases, really are destination points. Mm-hmm. And the two-way street and the activity that happens on both sides of a street are incumbent upon its success and its vitality. Yeah. So we had great two-way streets mm-hmm. and we had great transportation access there, but then we eliminated the two-way streets and replaced the, in many cases in our major thoroughfares with mm-hmm. one-way streets. Mm-hmm. And it really unintentionally, I believe, but unintentionally decimated mm-hmm. the ability to fully develop both sides of the street at that point. Yeah. So we have been very intentional over the last decade to bring back some of those two-way streets and We've had some success with that. Good. But that was the first attempt at, at revitalization of our was that, was that? that building the plaza on that block yeah, and then turning the streets in, into one-way streets. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Which they would always say that was about safety. And it's like... Exactly. Mm, <laughs> yeah. I would argue faster is not safer. The fascinating thing, those one-way streets, of course, are so ubiquitous. They are. Across, they are. like, literally <laughs> any downtown yep. in the country. And we're seeing so many incidences where folks are trying to figure out how to turn them back to two ways. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes it's, it's just like, yeah, it's expensive. But sometimes it's just like, well, crap, we're going to do it. Yeah. And and you see streets like, um, you know, Gay Street in Columbus. Oh, absolutely. Um, that was a one-way street that the city just said, yeah, we're going to make it two-way. Not a major thoroughfare. So that was a little bit easier. But it is extraordinarily expensive complicated shall we say expensive again um <laughs> maybe keep saying it. yeah all of the above. it's not just roads it's signals it's width it's runways yeah. it's striping yes yeah. it's, it's all that yeah I've th- i actually in my consulting career i did at least half a dozen one-way two-way street conversion studies and yes once you start looking at all the engineering it's like oh my gosh <laughs> absolutely but that gets back to that idea of, and we were especially good at this in the, I'm not trying to make an, a history lesson out of this, but in the that urban renewal era, we universally were really good at creating unintended consequences, you know? And it's so, not exceptional places. That's a very good point. Yeah. Unexceptional places. Yeah. What does that mean to you? To me, it's, you know, downtowns historically were centers of vibrancy. And everything in the community was designed to get people to that place in that moment. To the downtown. It was about developing deep relationships. And then somewhere along the way, we took a transactional mindset to downtowns. No, that's just a place you go down to do business or to drop something off, but it's not a place that you go and and hang out. Um, Now, again, I don't think that was intentional, but I think that's the byproduct of it. And so what happens is you don't create special places when you do that. Uh, you're not thinking about how one development might interact with another development next to it. It was more utilitarian in the way it was yeah. constructed. Uh, it served a purpose, and that purpose was a transaction of some sort. Mm-hmm. Now, today, I think there's far more intent around how you reimagine downtowns mm-hmm. and how you activate spaces that otherwise weren't active. I'll give you an example. So, post core renewal, 
uh, the buildings that weren't renewed and over time as the economy changed in our community, many of the vibrant buildings that were very active at one point in downtown became vacant and mm. became underutilized and in many cases became dangerous or eyesores at, at the very minimum. And one of the, the policies we kind of took on as a community is we're just going to tear those places down. Well, we have, as an old city, tremendous architecture in this mm-hmm. town, a lot of Romanesque architecture, a lot of, I don't particularly care too much for the 60s style of architecture, but that that's a thing for a lot of people and that's yeah. great. But we had a mix match of a ton of different, really significant period type architecture. And it became a matter of cost versus utility. And so, and I can see both sides of this. So I'm going to probably contradict myself. The cost to re- revitalize a structure is significant. Mm-hmm. And in economic development and in community development, Oftentimes, the role we play is a risk mitigator. Yeah. So we're trying to mitigate the risk associated with the redevelopment of something or the new development of something. Mm-hmm. Oftentimes, that's building regulations or it's zoning. But in more cases with downtown, they're financial risks. Right. And in the 80s, we didn't have the tools we have today uh, to mitigate that risk. And so the solution, the easiest path was to tear down and replace yep. But in our case, we tore down and didn't replace a lot of the structures. We did some. And that was so universal. Oh, absolutely. I could, be, oh, I could take you to question. cities all over the country absolutely. that did exactly that. Absolutely. Tear it down. Something's going to come. Something's going to come. Exactly. 40 years later, it's a vacant lot. That's exactly right. So think about that then. Mm-hmm. If you're thinking about downtown revitalization, uh, it's all about making sure that you're the people that are coming there feel a sense of place. So oftentimes we redevelop at a scale or a mass that is not commensurate with what was there before. So for right. instance, we tore down a building, we put a paid parking lot. And so you've got a building, you used to have a building in between and you're, you've got another building. So when you're a pedestrian walking on that sidewalk, you feel pretty safe mm-hmm. because you've got, maybe you have a tree line street. If you don't have tree lining, you maybe have some good curbing, right? So you right. Feel there's a buffer there. But you're protected got, from the cars. You're protected, but then you've got a building or a massive mm-hmm. building you're walking by. Mm-hmm. Well, in our case, we had a lot of missing teeth. Mm-hmm. And there have been a lot of studies, but people will generally not walk more than 400 feet in a downtown right. environment to get to something. And so we had, in that 400-foot experience for people, there were a lot of vacant lots. And there were a lot of derelict buildings. So the safety, whether it was real or perceived, safety became an issue for people. Mm-hmm. And so all of these things really started to snowball on our downtown. I think that's an important piece yeah. here is that it's not individual Absolutely. bits and pieces. This thing happened here and this thing happened here. It's agglomeration. It's the combination exactly. of all of those creating, as you said, a, a snowball exactly. effect. And I would tell you, too, I don't believe in my heart of hearts that any of that was done intentionally. Mm-hmm. No one said, hey, we're going to tear this building yeah. down for the hope that people don't feel safe. That's never the the intent. But without a plan that is executable, mm-hmm. that that maybe does have some big wins, but has incremental change built into it, you're not going to have a sustainable rebirth of anything. And so until we figured that out as a community, mm-hmm. uh, we struggled. Uh, we would have a lot of reinvestment and perceivably rebirth of downtown. It would be one-offs or it would be driven by the public sector largely, yeah. whether it's the community college or whether it's a, you know, a public utility or it's a, a jail or it's a public building. But it wasn't private investment. So it was not sustainable. It wasn't, it wasn't a, at least a positive, a enjoyable reason. Nobody goes to the jail for fun. Right? Well, that's right. I mean, no, that's right. That's just not going to be a destination right. for, you know, at least for the purposes that you're looking for. Yeah, absolutely. So, and again, so much of this is ubiquitous. So common. So many times I've heard a similar story. Springfield did some really interesting things. It has done some very interesting things over the last, you know, thir- let's call it 30 years, maybe more than that. But really to start trying to turn the corner. Yeah. And it seems as a as an outsider, I don't live here. I've come here occasionally over the last 25 years. It seems like that the place where that story started to turn starts in downtown. It does. And probably starts in downtown for the reasons of kind of that heart function that you were talking about before. <laughs> 